Well, good morning and welcome to our church service for April 26th, 2020. I know that this is now, I believe, week six of our time worshiping online, and this is certainly not what any of us had planned, but uh, I am excited for the opportunity that we have to be able to worship together and to still study the Word and stay connected to the Word together during this time. I do have a couple of announcements as we get started this morning. Uh, First of all, uh, all on-site services are canceled until further notice. And I know there's a lot of questions as to how things are going to go in this reopening time and and when we're going to start that. Um, There's still a lot of questions that we want to work through as a church, and we want to make sure that we're keeping everyone as safe as we can. So we'll continue in this uh, online format until further notice. So we'll continue to meet at 1030 on Sunday mornings. Uh, The video will be posted on Facebook as well as on our church website and in the church app. And then we will continue to meet on Wednesday nights on Facebook Live uh, for a brief Bible study as we talk about uh, more of what we're covering on Sunday mornings. I want to remind you that if you're able to give to the church during this time, uh, that we would greatly appreciate that support. Uh, this is a difficult time for a lot of people in a lot of ways, and we know that uh, for many people, they've lost their jobs. Many of you have lost jobs or have been laid off, and uh, so we don't want to put undue pressure on you during this time. But for those who are able to give, we greatly appreciate that support as we try to pay the bills during this, during this time. You can give online through our church website. You can give through, uh, through text by texting the word GIVE to 563-334-0110. And uh, you can give, type GIVE and a, an amount, and then it will process that donation for you. More importantly, though, I want to remind you that I am praying for each one of you every day. I spend time each day uh, in prayer for the church, and I pray through the church directory. Uh, So if you attend our church regularly, um, I pray for you by name. If you have a specific request that you would like me to pray for, then you can submit that request through the church app or through email or through text. Uh, Just let me know, reach out, and uh, please know that I am praying for you. Also this morning, I wanted to remind you that uh, the previous services and sermons can be watched on our website under the video sermon tab. If you would like to catch more music or more uh, sermons from the past, you can uh, you can watch there. And then we will follow the sermon this morning with a time of pre-recorded music. Uh, this time we're still on my sabbatical uh, in the music that we're showing, but it will be from uh, July 1st of 2018, uh, so a while back uh, for a, for a music set. I also wanted this morning to congratulate Jerry and Belinda Morley on reaching a milestone of 40 years of being married. Uh, I'm not sure which one of you deserves more congratulations, but we're excited for both of you as you as you reach this and uh, celebrate this day. And yet also we we struggle with you with the reality that we're not able to be together to celebrate this occasion. So we wanted to give a shout out and just let you know uh, happy anniversary from your church family. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this morning we come before you with hearts very aware of our need of you. And as we come to this time this morning, as we come to this this moment in our service where we lift our requests to you, uh, there are so many requests that weigh on our minds. For many in our congregation, they are serving on the front lines in retail and medical fields, in in delivery or or uh, truck driving, and and there's so many people who are in harm's way based on the decisions that they're they're making to serve the greater good. And I pray for your protection to be around them. And Father, this morning there are also a number in our church who are are laid off and not able to work when they so desperately want to work. And so we pray for your protection and your encouragement for them. And we also recognize this morning that there are many in our congregation who are kind of struggling with the realities of quarantine, the realities of, of being home and not being able to get out like we're used to, not being able to be together. I just pray for your strength for us during this time. Help us to make the use, best use of this time to uh, continue to grow, to be who you want us to be. And Father, we thank you just for the gift of your presence with us in the midst of the chaos we face. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we 
uh, move into our time in Scripture this morning. We're uh, transitioning uh, this week from the book of Second Corinth or from the book of Philippians into the book of Second Corinthians. Now, the book of Philippians was a, a letter that Paul had written in prison, and it was a letter that he wrote that uh, that really spoke joy to a group of people telling them that even in the midst of difficult circumstances, we can choose to be joyful, we can choose to rejoice, even when everything around us is falling apart. Now, Paul wrote a lot of letters, and he wrote a number of letters from in prison. He wrote a number of letters surrounding those times of imprisonment. And many scholars point to the book of 2 Corinthians as being written shortly after the book of Philippians. That Philippians was written during his time specifically of being imprisoned, and as soon as he was released from prison, he wrote this letter to the church in Corinth. I mentioned this a little bit on Wednesday night. The, the letter of 2 Corinthians is a letter that, um, that, that is, is a part of a series of letters. Um, we actually don't have all of the letters that were written by Paul to the church in Corinth, nor do we have any of the letters that the church in Corinth wrote back to Paul. Um, but it's a series of letters. The, the, there was a letter written, uh, didn't go over very well, so a letter was sent back to Paul. Paul then wrote them another letter, which we consider to be the letter of 1 Corinthians. Um, that one wasn't well received either. Another letter was sent back to Paul. Uh, Paul wrote another letter back to the church in Corinth um, that he calls the tearful letter. Um, and in between that letter, uh, he actually went and visited Corinth and things blew up and everything that he thought he could fix in person, he couldn't. So then he wrote the tearful letter and then he waits for a response. And while he's waiting for that response, his own life uh, in Ephesus, where he's stationed at this point in time, blows up and everything comes tumbling down around Paul. And the letter that Paul writes to the church in Philippi was written during this time when everything was blowing up, but probably at the tail end of that time um, of Paul's imprisonment. Paul was imprisoned for preaching the gospel, and most likely in Ephesus, the, uh, the silversmiths got together and caused a big riot because they wanted Paul to stop preaching that, that their gods were worthless, which was what they, he was preaching, um, but that there was only one God uh, because they were afraid they would be run out of business. And so they great, created this great riot, and everybody rioted, and everybody was, uh, was kind of chaotic. Uh, we talked about that on Wednesday night. And, and so Paul ends up, out of this riot, uh, being taken through the legal system. And it was illegal in those days to proclaim that there was only one God because the, the Roman people believed in a multitude of gods, chief of whom was the God who was the emperor. And so anyone who denied that the emperor was God, which is what Paul was saying and proclaiming that Jesus was Lord, anyone who denied that the emperor was, was God was breaking the law. And so Paul ends up in this imprisonment that is a very troubling time for him. And we don't know the specifics, but we know it was a deeply, deeply disturbing time in Paul's life. The letter to the church of Philippi was written at the tail end of that. And then the letter of uh, 2 Corinthians was written after that imprisonment. So after he's released from prison. So with that in mind, I want us to read through... Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting with verse 8. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn with me, or you can follow along on the screen. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learn to rely only on God, who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. And you are helping us by praying for us. Then many people will give thanks, because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. While we see as we we start this passage, that Paul found himself in the midst of a major problem. This major problem was, was most likely his imprisonment. And, and the, the imprisonment that Paul faced 
was, was such a difficult situation. He was at the end of what he could do. He, he tried everything that he could try because we know Paul to get himself out of this situation. And for the first time in his life, he found himself unable to fix it. Now, Paul was a very charismatic person. He was a a person that people loved to listen to. Some people hated to listen to, but most people loved to listen to him. And they would respond to Paul in such a way that he could usually talk his way out of any situation. In fact, the book of Acts tells us that when the crowds were rioting in in the the gathering place there in, in Ephesus, Paul wanted to go and speak to them. And his friends were like, no, you can't. They'll tear you apart. Paul thought he could talk himself out of anything or out of any situation, but he found out here that he couldn't. But as I read through this passage, I'm reminded that Paul didn't just face this big problem of of being imprisoned, but there was a bigger problem that he had to face. The bigger problem is what was taking place inside of his heart. The reliance that he had built on himself. And a part of why 2 Corinthians is so powerful is because Paul shares with us throughout this letter little bits and pieces of him coming to the end of himself and realizing that he wasn't as brilliant and he wasn't as powerful as he thought he was. Now that's profound. That's a a very important thing for Paul because truthfully, we probably would not know about the Apostle Paul if it weren't for this situation that he went through. The letters that Paul had written prior to this point of Galatians and 1 Corinthians are not his nicest letters. Quite honestly, the letter to the Galatians, we read it and we conclude it in Scripture because it is from, from Paul. But there are a number of scholars, including Martin Luther from um, the, the Great Reformation, who said that should not be included in Scripture because Paul is very rude in the book of Galatians. He's calling the people stupid and, and, and can't understand why they would not just follow after him. The letter of 1 Corinthians, he's pretty arrogant as he writes this letter. He's, he's explaining to the people um, that, that he's right, and they should just give in because he is their spiritual father. But something shifts, something happens in between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And it centers on this bigger problem. Not just Paul being in prison, that was a big problem. But the bigger problem that Paul faced every day, regardless of whether he was in prison or out of prison. And that bigger problem was the problem of himself. It's a problem that we all have to come face to face with at some point in our lives. We all have to come face to face with the reality that that given who we are and our gifts and our abilities and our personalities, we can accomplish a lot. But we're still limited until we fully commit ourselves to God. And He can only use us to a certain extent before we completely surrender to Him. And most of us live our lives never coming to that point. Paul comes to the end of himself here in in the imprisonment in Ephesus And out of this, he writes the book of 2 Corinthians. Out of this, he wrote the books of of, uh, Philippians and Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon. And shortly after he writes the book of 2 Corinthians, he's going to write the book of Romans. So Paul's best work as an author, as a teacher, comes after this experience, not before. And I think for us as as a people... Our best work comes not when we're relying on ourselves, but when we fully learn to rely on God. Paul shares with the people that they were, they were at the end of ourselves. He says, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, 
we stopped relying on ourselves and we learned to rely only on God. We have placed our confidence in Him, he says in verse 10. That's the answer to Paul's problem. The crazy thing is that in this story, the book of Acts leaves out this imprisonment. We know it happened because of the letters that he wrote of, of Philippians and, and Ephesians and Colossians and, and Philemon that were written from prison. But the book of Acts doesn't even talk about the big problem. But Paul is very clear throughout the book of 2 Corinthians in talking about the bigger problem. The bigger problem is himself. It's, it's his desire to take control, his desire to fix everything and make everything messier in the process instead of relying on God. That's the bigger problem. So as we look at this story, as this letter unfolds, we're going to see how Paul's life is changed as a result of this this transforming work that God brings about. And I want to ask you, are you coming to the end of yourself? Now, this, this pandemic has been going on now for quite some time. We're six weeks into the shutdown of not being able to meet in large groups and churches not being able to meet and many businesses shut down. And many of us are finding that we're coming to the end of ourselves. It may be a result of, of being on the front lines and just feeling like we can't go on another day or it may be from the feeling of we've lost our jobs and we're not sure how we're going to provide and we're not sure when this is going to end and if we're going to get our jobs back. Or it may be that we're quarantined at home and we're just so sick of looking at ourselves in the mirror and watching TV, we really want to get out and do something again. But I think there's a good chance that we're coming to the end of ourselves in the midst of this. Paul realized as he came to the end of himself that he was only able to do so much and left to his own desires and his own strength, he had to say, you know, I thought we were going to die. I fixed a lot of things in my life. I couldn't fix this one. And many of us right now feel the same way. This week has been an interesting week for me. I've, I've spent a lot of time reflecting this week. Uh, part of it was intentional and part of it wasn't intentional. Earlier this week, I, I made some changes to a computer and, um, and started cleaning up hard drives. Uh, I don't know about uh, those of you that, that have computers and, and I have a lot of hard drive storage. I think I've got about five or six external hard drives and then I've got some pretty big hard drives in, in both my personal computer at, at home and then the, the church's computer. And so one of the things that I, one of the projects I tackled this week was cleaning up the hard drive and going through and finding all the duplicate files and, and I'd saved this file here and I'd saved it there and I'd saved it there. And as I was doing that, I came across some videos of of me preaching or of the church, uh, things going on in the church earlier in my time here in Davenport over the last nine years. And as I watched back through some of those videos, I honestly was kind of disturbed with, with how angry I came across and, and how, how much I was struggling with anger. And I could see that in my preaching. And several people commented on that, but, but I really felt that as I was watching this, these videos. And then as a part of my Sabbath, I, I spent some time just going back through old journals. One of the spiritual practices that, that I hold desperately to is, is the practice of journaling. And I try to take time on a daily basis just to journal where I'm at and, and, and journal through my relationship with God. 
a part of it is because I'm so easily distracted and, and I'll start to pray, but then I get distracted by this and this and this. And so if I'm writing the prayer down, I can at least come back to it and finish the prayer as, I, as I'm uh, going through my, my journaling activity. But as I was reading through those journals over the last eight years, I was struck by my anger and some of the challenges that I was facing some things that that in my life God had to bring me to the end of myself. And much of that's taken place in the last five years where, where God challenged me and said, Emmanuel, you're a different person on Sunday morning, even though you're coming across slightly angry there. You're a very different person when you're at home and you're very angry there. And God challenged me and said, that, that's not okay. It's not okay for Janelle. It's not okay for the girls to see you this angry and to be treated the way that you're treating them. And it's not okay for you to, to live this, this dual life of looking like you have it all together when really you don't. And this week I, I reflected back on that time and there were some, some clear moments where I laid everything out before God and and. and surrendered everything to him but there were also a lot of situations where the changes took place over time and i didn't realize that they had taken place but looking back on them now i see how different i am i think for paul there's a lot of that as well you sense in what he's writing here in second corinthians this this looking back on this time of desperation and yet knowing that as he writes the letter he's somewhere better he's in a better place not just because he's out of jail because the book of philippians was written while he was still in jail and and it is is definitely in a better place than first corinthians this change took place that morphed paul from being this angry i'm gonna control this guy to relying fully on god and placing his confidence in God, not in himself. Now I want you to understand, this is not a matter of salvation. This is not a matter of, am I saved? Am I following after Jesus? In the Church of the Nazarene, we call this entire sanctification. It's this, this full commitment to God, the recognition that I can't do on my own what he needs to do in me. It's not a matter of, am I saved or am I following after Jesus? But it's a coming to the end of myself and recognizing that even though I've been trying to follow Jesus, I've been trying to do that in my own strength. And I can't do it the way that it needs to be done. I have to acknowledge that I can't do it. I can't fix it. I can't make it better and surrender it fully to God. I can't help but wonder right now if a lot of us aren't feeling this way coming to the end of ourselves and and getting grumpy with our with our family or getting grumpy with ourselves really struggling in this time whether you're on the front lines or whether you're at home struggling to know how do i keep going and sometimes our faith feels like it's failing us but faith isn't failing us we're coming to the end of ourselves. And the answer to coming to the end of yourself is, is not to try harder. It's to rely completely on the grace of Jesus Christ. To open yourself up to God doing something in you that is greater than what you have experienced before. And allowing Him to transform from the inside out who you are and how you interact with the world. It's been my experience this week as I've reflected back on, on this journey for myself. I've just experienced this sense of, wow, God. You have done so much more than I ever dreamed that you would do as I came to the end of me and started depending fully on you. And that's what Paul is saying here as well. Paul is telling the church in Corinth, I came to the end of myself and now I'm saying, wow, God, you are doing so much more. And we also see in, 
in Paul's story how his ability to to accomplish things for the kingdom of God was multiplied tremendously because he went through this period of brokenness and accepting that he wasn't as strong as he thought. So my desire for us this morning is that we also would come to that place of saying, God, there are things that that I want to control. There are things that I really wish I could figure out, but I can't control them. And so I give them to you. I surrender who I am and all that, that I am to you. And here's what Paul said God did. He said, as we learn to rely on God, he rescued us. As we placed our confidence in Him, He will continue to rescue us. And He he will rescue us again. As we continue through this time of quarantine, as we continue through this time of pandemic, I encourage you to just lean fully into God. When you've reached the end of yourself and you don't know what you're going to do, lean heavily into Him because He does know what he wants to do and he will rescue you and he will rescue you again and as we continue to put our confidence in him he will continue to rescue us and know that i'm praying for you in this time know that my prayer for you those of you that have sent me specific requests i certainly lift those to the lord but I'm also praying that that you will find in him everything you need during this time of isolation. That you would find in him everything that you need during this time of being on the front lines. It is in him that we find peace. It is in him that, that we truly learn how to live life. So I'm praying for you. And let's close by praying together the prayer that the Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.